puducheri only okay okay you can start your uh, talk yeah. over to you ah uh, yeah i can operate from here yes sir we can hear no i just uh, the, the slides are not moving the topic thank you very much no one second you please go to the previous slide right uh i thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity the topic given is jaundice and labs luckily it is not labs and jaundice like many people do investigation first and then go to the patient slide i am not able to operate from here right the advantages of conventional liver function test or it is a good screening test for liver function though not complete pattern of the disease and we can differentiate acute liver disease from chronic we can also find out to certain extent the severity of complications etc by king's criteria and child push score then the follow up of the treatment particularly in chronic liver disease drug induced liver disease autoimmune liver disease post transfusion etc it also helps to make specific diagnosis clues we can get from this biochemical i will be talking only on biochemical tests in a jaundice patient the transaminases will be abnormally high more than 1000 in certain conditions like viral hepatitis autoimmune hepatitis dili that means drug induced liver disease of course you can get it even in dengue shock etc ischemic then serum bile acids and very low ggtp we do see in pfic 1 and 2 and absent urinary ketones in fatty acid oxidation defects they are all useful clues that you can get from biochemical test slide slide now when you mean liver disease there need not always be liver disease but if the patient is jaundice you can have abnormal lft but the liver may be normal for example gilbert and dubin johnson the patient is jaundice but most of the liver tests are normal for example in a growing child with rickets the sap may be very high the child may not be having jaundice then transaminases may be high in myopathies prothrombin time may be high in vitamin k deficiency the other side is you can have a normal lft but silent chronic liver disease for example it may be chronic hepatitis it may be inactive compensated cirrhosis liver non cirrhotic portal fibrosis like that slide slide operator slide i am not able to operate from here hello lata slide slide is moving lata yes change the slide hello so we are able to hear hello hello sir the slide is changed sir hello sir oh, yeah. somebody has to operate for me right when they say slide you can operate you are going on changing you go to the previous slide madam previous slide sir uh, is this the slide slide ah uh, yeah okay when they say slide you can change right okay sir see the conventional liver function test if you ask they are not 100% effective in finding out the liver function they are also not very specific for example if you do sap and uh, ggtp in your cholestatic jaundice it doesn't tell you whether it is intrahepatic or extrahepatic cholestasis so there is incomplete information similarly you can have the severity also cannot be assessed fully by all the tests so it is found it the scientifically it has been documented now various international associations also have agreed 
that liver function test in a jaundiced patient is a misnomer. It's only a colloquial term and now obsolete. So henceforth, we have to call, we have to request the lab as liver biochemistry or liver chemistry test and not liver function test. Slide. Slide, please. Yeah. When I approach H infantile jaundice, I have three categories of presentation. One is neonatal onset. The second one, neonatal onset, but they may get prolonged little late onset, maybe after two weeks of birth. And the third one is late onset, beyond infancy. Of course, beyond infancy, acute chronic and acute and chronic disease we can encounter. Two important things have to be learned from this slide. One, in the newborn, the clinical jaundice can be appreciated if the serum belly is more than 5 milligrams per deciliter. But beyond infancy, you can appreciate clinical jaundice only if the serum bilirubin is even 2 milligrams per cent. There are many people who may argue, what about 1 milligram? If it is 1 milligram per cent, it's called latent jaundice. The second one, all infantile or beyond infancy jaundice patients, there is no point in asking for a serum total belly. We have to go in for fractionation. Now, why do you want to do a fractionation? Slide. Slide. Slide, please. Operator, slide. Change, sir. Hello, madam. Am I audible? Actually, slide is changed, but the connection is slow, it seems. Your connection is slow. No, no, I am not operating. That's the problem here. Right. I should have used my own slide. Doesn't matter. Now, why should you want to do a fractionation and not only total serum bilirubin? If you do a fractionation, you will get direct and indirect, which is not the better term, but conjugated bili and unconjugated bili are better. Conjugated bili is water soluble, low molecular weight. So if it is low molecular weight, it comes easily through the kidney. So bile pigment will be present, bile salts will be present in the urine. And it's also excreted in the intestine. Then you will get, probably if it is not excreted, you will get a pale stool of cholestasis. Itching can be there in these people in conjugated hyperbole. It is not toxic, but it can produce intense jaundice, pruritus, xanthoma, portal hypertension, fat soluble vitamin deficiency, particularly in biliary prolonged cholestasis, like bilirectrisia. In contrast, unconjugated bili is a high molecular weight and it's not filtered by the kidney. So it is not present in the urine when there is hemolysis or prehepatic jaundice. And of course, the stool is always pigmented. It is present only in the plasma and you don't have itchy. But it is toxic. Toxic to the brain as a classical example, you will get connectors. Slide. The best way to approach a child, irrespective of the age, is three questions we can always ask <laughs> within ourselves before you approach a child. One, is there any liver injury with jaundice? If so, how severe? You do the OTPT, if they are extremely high, beyond 1000, it is an acute liver injury like acute viral hepatitis, drug induced, autoimmune, ischemic, like that. If you want to know the severity, you can do a synthetic function. Serum albumin or prothrombin time. But prothrombin time is better in acute liver failure when compared to. But the question is, albumin can be low in other liver diseases also. But the best way is reversal of AD ratio is typical of cirrhosis, less than one. The second question is either cholestasis. 
if there is cholestasis, there is deep jaundice, and urine is dark yellow, pale stool may be there, itching may be there. If there is cholangitis, high toxic fever may be there. And you look for cholestatic enzymes, particularly SAP and GGTP. Why nucleotides we don't do because it's costly. If you rule out these two, you can rule out other metabolic conditions. Then you can gather other informations like probably GGTP. If the GGTP is low and if the patient is having a cholestatic jaundice and total BLE is high, probably it indicates PFIC 1 and 2. In PFIC 3, you get normal or elevated GGTP. Slide. Slide. Hello, slide please. Ah, I just finished. Now, the prothrombin time is more useful as a definitive prognostic marker, particularly if it is very high in spite of giving vitamin K for two days, IV. So if it is more than two milligrams, it is abnormal. And if it is more than, uh, sorry, four, two seconds, if it is more than four seconds, probably we don't do liver biopsy. If the INR is more than 1.5, we don't do liver biopsy. If the INR is more than three or four, probably it is an indication for liver transplant. Slide. Now even people go up to six. Slide. Yeah. Now, this is a summary of all the tests, which will help us to know whether we are having a hemolytic jaundice or liver disease induced viral hepatitis or drug induced hepatitis or cirrhosis or chronic hepatitis etc. Hepatic and the last one is of course extra hepatic maybe extra biliary obstruction. For example, in hemolytic jaundice we have already told absence of urinary bilirubin, bile pigment, bile salts. Billy may be high, but it will not be very high, less than usually 10. And unconjugated is more predominant. And alkaline phosphatase and AGOTPT will be normal. If you take a liver injury or parenchymal liver disease, then with jaundice, the urine bile pigment may appear even before the clinical manifestation of jaundice. And Bile salts usually absent, but they may be present if there is cholestasis. Total belly will be high, which may not be very high. Conjugated is more than unconjugated. And what APT is in acute liver disease will be very high, particularly viral hepatitis. And if there is cholestasis, probably you will have the SAP, GGTP high, otherwise it is normal. The GGTP SAP ratio may be less than one. If it is extra hepatic portal hypertension, that is post hepatic, probably urine belly, bile salts will be present. Total will be also will be enormously high. OTPTs will be moderately raised. Polystatic enzymes will be abnormally high. Slide. Slide. Oh, yeah. Now this is time for us to know are we dealing with acute? hepatitis with jaundice or chronic liver disease or cholestasis. Acute liver disease, BILI will be high, amino, amino transferase which will be abnormally high in acute, organ phosphatase, maybe little raised and albumin normal unless there is liver cell failure because it's a synthetic uh, content and prothrombin will be also normal unless there is abnormal liver cell failure. Chronic hepatitis and cirrhosis go together. All symptoms of jaundice, liver cell, the enzymes will be not, not very high, but AG ratios will be abnormal. In cholestasis, I have already told jaundice, cholestatic enzymes will be abnormally high. Slide. There is one condition which gastroenterologists in our department we do see occasionally. 
if there is acute liver injury or chronic liver injury if there is toxic element like herbal powders or sepsis with renal involvement the serum bilirubin will go up beyond 30 we have seen up to 67 mg 70 also so if it is more than 30 you call it is hyper hyper bilirubinemia slide slide please ah we do ask for repeated liver chemistry tests like conditions drug induced liver disease monitoring acute liver cell failure in icu persistent progressive jaundice of course uh, chronic liver disease follow up acute liver cell function in post transplant patients we do see repeated tests slide slide hello slide please doctor am i audible yes yes it changed sir it takes some time i think physiological jaundice so, um, slide is physiological jaundice and pathological jaundice sir so here it's changed sir i think the, uh, the slide is some changed time. now the physiological Because, are you able to see yeah. right now the time has come to differentiate in the neonatal jaundice are we dealing with physiological pathological yeah if the jaundice is after 24 hours if the rise of serum bile is more than 5 mg per deciliter per day and reaching the maximum on probably the end of the week and clears by 14 days and no sequelae child is well taking breastfeeding serum bile is invariably less than 15 okay fine physiological jaundice in contrast if the jaundice appears even within the first day of life rise of bile is very high faster more than 5 per deciliter and total bile may be very high more than 15 and the jaundice usually lasts for more than 14 days urine is yellow and stool is pale and the concentration of bilirubin conjugate is usually more than 2 mg and if the if the newborn if the conjugate the serum bile is more than 5 mg 20% will be conjugated so we may be able to differentiate by biochemical tests of serum bile alone physiological or pathological in relation to the history also slide <coughs> unconjugated bile this is a very interesting topic now we do see we treat people there are three types of jaundice related to breastfeeding one is a physiological jaundice the child is breastfed second day onwards the child develops jaundice maybe getting the peak by fifth day and clears off within a week or 10 days maximum 14 days and serum bile is not very much high and it resolves by 14 days i told you if it is more than 18 probably the child resolves with phototherapy very occasionally exit transfusion no now breast milk jaundice onset is usually end of first week and lasts for up to 12 weeks bile is always raised sometimes very high up to 30 mg and by 12 weeks of age and usually clears by 12 weeks so by second or third week it reaches the peak and slowly is coming down later usually no treatment if you really want to have some doubt is it breast milk jaundice and if really you start the milk for a day or two it stops coming down but we don't do as the child is doing well breast feeding jaundice is something which is nothing but an exaggerated physiological jaundice in a breastfed infant and it starts early and lasts up to 7 days and bile is not very high but this jaundice the child will be losing weight dehydrated little not very comfortable and clears off within a week's time this is the typical and you can do very well by giving frequent feeding of 8 to 10 times or express breast milk or milk from blood bank as uh, sorry uh, breast bank and donor milk or formula milk something can be done for these children and the child will do very well it is supportive slide 
स्लाइड प्लीज आर यू एबल टू हियर आर या नाउ इफ यू रियली वांट टू हैव डाउट्स व्हाट आर वी डीलिंग विथ अ चाइल्ड विद जॉन्डी सपोज इफ यू सस्पेक्ट अ लिवर इंजरी टू डू ओटीपीटी व्हिच विल बी हाई एंड पीटी विल बी मोर देन ओटी दैट्स व्हाट आई वांट टू टेल यू सपोज इफ द SAP and GGTP are very high cholestasis. SAP is high, but GGTP may be normal in PFSC one and two, which I already told you. GGTP SGPT ratio more than one probably suspects some obstruction in the biliary tree. Mixed hyperbilirubinemia with urine for Benedict's positive for sugar. suspect galactosemia urine containing amino acid ureas high very high more than 1000 5000 uh, levels of uh, alpha fetoprotein urine succinyl acetone for confirmation tyrosine levels may be high genetic probably inherited disorder autosomal recessive suspect tyrosinemia one beauty in doing suspecting Uh, either galactosemia or tyrosemia in our setup is these children will go for liver cell failure very early one of the causes of neonatal jaundice with liver cell failure if you are asked always think of galactosemia or tyrosemia or other metabolic conditions slide tyrosemia can be associated with rickets i we will rapidly go through some of the case scenarios are right. now don't change this slide a 64 day old infant born well birth weight is normal growing well breastfed uh, probably end of first week or second week the child develops uh, di diaper staining yellow you stool is becoming totally pale and uh, the liver is huge so the triad of biliary atresia this dark colored urine pale colored stool persistent Large liver in a normal child without any dysmorphism. Slide. It can usually present early in embryonic type. Slide. Next slide, please. Uh, we do investigation in these people specifically. Total bile will be high. Conjugated will be abnormally high, and OTPT is moderate. the cholestatic enzymes will be abnormally high then you make a diagnosis the neonatal cholestatic syndrome usually starts by 2 weeks of life last for 2 weeks does not relow resolve even after 2 weeks you remember the 2 weeks then you also remember 1 2 3 3 this is what we teach the post graduate one means single diagnosis are we dealing with biliary atresia are we dealing with neonatal hepatitis are we dealing with pfic in the first group the second group is one to these three the second one is the is it neonatal hepatitis or biliary atresia <clears throat> the third one we always tell them are we dealing with tyrosinemia or galactosemia or allergenic syndrome this is what we normally teach them easy to remember mnemonics right we do fasting ultrasound and followed by liver biopsy and paraoperative polygraph for confirmation the second child is 82 days old uh with a birth weight of uh, 2.3 breastfed otherwise looking okay but the jaundice is also moderately high and stool is intermittently pale dark colored urine liver and spleen felt i hope you may be able to appreciate the marks on the skin and there is a nodule bluish which is nothing but blueberry muffin due to extra hepatic erythropoiesis the you have to look for if you are able to see this type of bluish nodules probably cmiv infection slide now when you do your liver function test but uh, sorry liver chemistry test the serum bile is high predominantly conjugated the otpds are high 
the polystatic enzymes are moderately raised prothrombin time unless it is liver cell failure it is normal so we try to do other etiological workup non glucose reducing substance the ngrs negative alpha alpha vitoprotein normal ferritin normal i for particularly cataract and retinitis normal touch infections are negative X-ray dorsal spine for allergy butterfly vertebra normal, lipid profile for polystasis normal, echo is normal for associated malformations. So we did a liver biopsy which turned out to be neonatal hepatitis, and this excludes extra hepatic biliary atresia. Slide. The two-year-old seven months infant child. Uh, jaundice from third month of life. That means late onset jaundice. Intermittently pale and pigmented stool and pruritus very intense as you see. Slide, uh, uh, click the, you can click it, Pa. Please click it. Apply the click. The slide will not change. You apply the click. Ah. So the diagnosis that we thought because of PFIC, the mother had polystasis during pregnancy in the last trimester. There were sip deaths in the family, similar illness. The child is scratching, scratching, producing a lot of callosities. The liver and spleen were little firm on consistency. Slide. We did the investigation. Conjugate bilirubin is high. Total belly is high. The serum transaminases are normal. Alkyl phosphatase is high, but DGTP was very low. So we make a diagnosis of PFIC 1 and 2, and in PFIC 3, the DGTP will be normal or high. They are all transport diseases, membrane defects, nutation defects, slide, which are commonly seen now. 37-day-old infant, breastfed, two sip deaths in the family, consanguineous marriage of parents. The child spent a longer time in the NICU with fulminant almost sepsis and very severe gram-negative septicemia, pneumonia, and mixed hyperbilirubinemia. The CRP was high. Platelets were very low. Total belly unconjugated, relatively higher than conjugated, but mixed. Uh, OTPTs and uh, albumin was a little low, alkyl phosphatase mildly high, DGTP is also slightly abnormal, otherwise normal. But the beauty in this child is the child had liver cell failure during the course of illness. And what we found was the prothrombin time was abnormally high despite vitamin K. So we can make a diagnosis of this particular child, mixed hyperbilirubinemia, neonatal cholestasis, liver and spleen felt, severe septic element is there, this particular child, also having diarrhea because of breast milk, and we made a clinical diagnosis of probably galactosemia. Metabolic because sip deaths are there, consanguineous marriage. Slide. The best information that we got to support our diagnosis was non-glucose reducing substance. It's not urine, the glucose sticks, but you have to do the Benedict test, which was positive. Brick red, you, as you see, the child are also having cataract. The type of cataract that we see in these people are bilateral oil drop cataract. It is not sunflower cataract or Wilson. And you see the big liver and spleen. Why should you know about this disease? Our diagnosis was clinical, plus our diagnosis was biochemical, and of course, you can do a Galta say, sepsis screening, notation, genetic studies, etc. The child improved, did very well. It is a treatable condition if you remove the breast milk. Slide. Investigations in this child, we do the other causal factors are all negative, very easy to make a diagnosis. Slide. A very common disease in a school-going child, otherwise well, 
but drinking water everywhere eating everywhere and not vaccinated against hepatitis a the child had suddenly became nausea vomiting a loss of appetite fatigability a little migraine one, one day fever uh, upper abdominal pain dyspeptic symptoms and urine was yellow the grandmother makes a diagnosis usually but putting the urine into the rice which will become yellow staining like a diaper and of course the child had a mild tender liver due to perihepatitis so you can make a diagnosis of acute viral hepatitis the investigation show i'm sorry it is for hidden there you have a abnormally very high transaminases serum bile is mildly raised to maybe 5 or 6 and the child may go for polycystic phase in the second week and try to recover in about 3 weeks time it's a self limiting condition some people call it as even flu of the liver so the diagnosis is definitely slight you put the click acute viral hepatitis and we did the screening for etiology which turned out to be hiv igm positive the child did very well maybe little less than 0.5% pulmonary hepatic failure please be aware that this can become a toxic hepatitis if they give herbal powders unnecessarily which may have contained heavy metals which can toxic produce the toxicity of the liver and the child may go in for pulmonary hepatic failure second slide <laughs> slide yeah so we have done now the time is up for to know what are all the conditions where you get a very high abnormal serum transaminases serum transaminases i have already told you earlier drugs autoimmune uh, pulm bilsens or uh, then uh, ischemic acute viral hepatitis like that the other conditions infections and other things you will get moderate raise only slight quick quick there is a considerable delay time should be given to me for allowing me to for exchange of slides please put this click the slide again yeah it is not time for us to commonly you get jaundice mild with acute viral hepatitis versus other infections like malaria then uh, dengue or enteric fevers occasionally let to so important thing that will help you for biochemical differentiation is markedly raised transaminases as well as serum bile of course the pt may be very high in liver cell failure in acute viral hepatitis in malaria ma endemic area fever with chills and of course moderate anemia and mild thrombocytopenia in dengue which is spoken everywhere as a topic of the day moderate rise in liver enzymes dengue shock we have very high liver enzymes thrombocytopenia but the clue is always a high hemoglobin level indicating mm -hmm. thrombocytosis hemo concentration enteric fever you get leukopenia and lymphocytosis in these people early slide and spleen may be palpable drug induced liver disease very important thing is alkaline phosphatase and the the alt alkyl phosphatase ratio is a very dependable one other than the other one of course increased more than 5 in hepatocellular cholestasis is low and mixed 2 to 5 but when do you suspect always up to 3 upper limit of normal of alt is allowed you can give the medicine maybe att or some other medicine anti convulsants etc so if it is more than 3 probably you have to consider drug toxicity if it is jaundice definitely not pre existing jaundice after the drug you have to suspect drug induced toxicity slide now chronic liver disease cirrhosis very important when do you consider how much value you can give it to the biochemical very important this thrombocytopenia Thromb persistent thrombocytopenia or pancytopenia persistent thrombocytopenia is an indicator of uh, underlying fibrosis also the, it is due to the sequestration of platelets from the spleen but pancytopenia may be due to hypersplenism associated all electrolyte imbalance may occur ammonia may be high 
serum albumin may be low, but other conditions also extra hepatic you can have, like nephrotic syndrome, hyperproteinemia, protein losing entropy, etc. But the most important AG liver cell less than one is significant of cirrhosis. PT may be very high as a prognostic marker. Every score is a useful one. That means aspartate platelet ratio index. That means where you can have, if it is very high, it indicates cirrhosis. In acetic patients with cirrhosis, if the SAG is more than one, it is indicative of portal hypertension and cirrhosis. Slide. Other conditions in chronic liver disease, infection screening with antibodies, PCR test will help you. Clinical, supportive. Wilson's disease, suspicion, then family history, then about three to four years of age, then serum ceruloplasmin less than 15, urine copper without uh, probably the chemo uh, therapeutic agents, without uh, this 24 urine copper is more than 40 or more diagnostic if it is more than 100, then I for KF ring will help you. Autoimmune, suspicion, it is a, one which is always a challenge to gastroenterologists also. We do see a lot of cases now. We have made them perfectly all right in the long term for follow-up. You do come stress. ANA and smooth muscle antibody may be type 1. LKM type 2, which is more common. They may come with liver disease and you can, IgG will be very high in these people. Extra hepatic manifestation may be there. HLS, little rare. You can do serum triglycerides, cholesterol, ferritin, bone marrow, biopsy, etc. Slide. And prognostic marker. I will take only three minutes. Prognostic markers, particularly, if the child is not having encephalopathy, ascites is not there, serum bile is also not much, and albumin is normal, prothrombin time is normal, nutrition is normal, good prognosis, if we a physician, pediatrician can treat along with the consultation of gastroenterologist. We will help you. But if the child's book score is 2, it is moderate. That means the child will be having male jaundice, grade 1 encephalopathy, that means uh, neurosensory uh, behavior disorders, and albumin will be little, mainly decreased, maybe 3 to 3.5. Serum Billy is 2.5 to 4. And prothrombin time is less than four or four to six, and mild malnutrition or good malnutrition, and you leave it to gastroenterologists, and we will be treating them in consultation with liver transplant person. Grade three is of course very severe in stage liver disease. Everything is out of control. You got to hand it over to the liver specialist. Slide. Slide. Ah, any shortcut method for diagnosing jaundice in your child? Yes. This is, you do a clinical examination, history and physical examination, provisional diagnosis. Liver chemistry tests, you do urine, albumin, uh, sorry, urine for bile, pigment bile salt, but most important is serum bile, conjugate or unconjugate. We will have two groups of jaundice. If the child is having jaundice with conjugated hyperbilly, and if their liver function tests are abnormal, like ALT, AST, ALP, and if the AST, ALT alone are raised very much, think of hepatocellular injury like viral hepatitis. If it is predominantly the GGTP, very high, think of cholestasis, in addition to SAP. If it is both are normal, probably the liver is perfectly normal, reassure them it is Dubin-Johnson or Rotor. Now come to unconjugated. Unconjugated bilirubin, you do always prehepatic. That means you have to think of only hematological like hemolysis. So hematological studies, hemoglobin, haptoglobin, blood smear for any abnormal structural RBCs like spherocytosis or thalassemic microcytic hypochromic anemia. Reticulocyte count may be usually above six. And these people, evidence of hemolysis is present. You think of hemolytic jaundice. If, if no hemolysis, probably Gilbert's or Krigler-Najjar syndrome. Krigler-Najjar type 1 usually dies early. 
treated with your type 2 can create a problem, leave it to gastroenterologist. We will do it as a persistent unconjugated hyperbilly. Slide. Last slide. Slide. Now, what is the carry home message? The carry home message is useful tips. Suspect hepatocellular jaundice, do SGPT more than SGOT. And the ratio is more than ALP. Now, cholestasis, cholestatic enzymes are more than the liver enzymes, particularly transaminases. If the bilirubin is very high, if it is direct, more than indirect, cholestatic. Indirect, more than direct, prehepatic. Direct is almost more or less mixed, hepatic. It is not your truth. You can have direct higher than the indirect in hepatic also, particularly in cholestasis. Albumin, if it's normal, fine. It may be denoting acute viral hepatitis without liver cell failure or cholidocolithiasis. But if the AG reversal is less than one, think of cirrhosis. Prothrombin time and INR, in spite of giving vitamin K for two days in a chronic liver disease, it suggests hepatic liver dysfunction. Acute cases, parastomal poisoning or acute viral hepatitis with liver cell failure. If the patient improves with vitamin K, good liver function. If the patient does not improve, poor, bad liver. Severe hepatocyte. Last slide. Slide. So, I want to thank my gastroenterology department where we have fellowships for postgraduates, one-year fellowships for uh, <clears throat> IPCON, and then we thank the department for giving us all materials, cases for presenting. Excellent, furnished, well-equipped gastroenterology OP to the national level, international level. The second one, we thank the opportunity given to me by the scientific committee who has chosen an excellent talk, topic, and for giving me an opportunity to the organizing committee. For all of you, if the hall is empty or full or moderator mail, I do not know. I am not able to see for your listening with interest. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. God bless you. Any doubt, anything, you can always approach me. The department is at your disposal. We will help you. And I want all the practicing pediatricians to be familiar about what we have been practicing in our department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Your choice. Any questions, we welcome. Thank you, sir. Your presentation is very excellent and very all the slides are very clear cut. Especially we are able to differentiate the color discoloration. I mean, color the of jaundice. And for lab test is important in the liver disease, especially for diagnosis, treatment as well as prognosis. So thank you very much for your presentation. I, I want the, to ask the chairperson your question. Yes. What are the types of patients you come across? Sir, I was a retired person from the, I was working as a, um, a specialist in the neurology department, sir. Oh, right. Okay. I will give you the answer. The type of people that you come across in office practice are different in my clinic. I am a consultant. I come, people coming with big files. So I would like to tell them not to see the lab reports first. They are eager to show. Everything will be shown to you to confuse you. And they will always tell what, how they went, how many people went, how did they see the doctor, what did the doctor say, all those things. It is storytelling. They will never come to any conclusion. They will never help you. Stop them and go ahead. You got to make a real disease and things, improvement is cure. That is also very important. They become, they become all right, they won't come for follow-up. Second, they show the investigation, mass health checkup, etc., and then you try to treat the lab, but leave the patient. It is lab disease. Third, in the office, they discuss among themselves and try to go into the Google and try to understand so many things. Stop your medicine, add your medicine, purchase locally. Anything can go on. Google disorder. The next one is, of course, friend's suggestion. They go doctor after doctor, shopping of doctors. The next one, of course, is they have no other idea. Somebody comes on a fine day and tell you, Self-medication or alternate pathies, naturopathy, homeopathy, 
and uh, allopathy, Ayurvedic, of course, last, when the patient becomes worse, they go to Venkata Chalapati. These are all the things that can go on. Please sort out, very nicely said by Mahadevan today, that you don't treat the disease, you don't treat the person, you be with the person and try to understand what is going on. Always I tell my patients, if I am very clear about, clear about my diagnosis, you will be all right. I am not a prescriber. I have been given license. I will understand. I will not ask for any test. Don't worry. Stop all these things. And go ahead like that. This okay. is an additional information just out of experience. Nothing. Thank you so much. I hope you all get the benefit. How, how many people are there in the hall? Any? any? So 20 to 25 people are there. Ah, right. Okay. Post lunch session. Ah, post lunch, you know. <laughs> the scientific evidence. Sir, uh, thank you for the wonderful talk, sir. Okay, sir. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? Anybody who wants to ask question? The self-explanatory? No, no, sir. No, no questions, sir. Thank no you, questions. sir. Yeah. Thank you. Now, I'd like to welcome Dr. Rahul Yadav for the next session. Uh, for the session on uh, approach to sudden deterioration in an unit. Dr. Rahul Yadav is a renowned unitologist in Chennai and currently practices at Rainbow Hospital, Chennai. For the past 29 to 30 years, Sir has worked as a newborn infant specialist and gained proficient skills and knowledge in various segments. He's a well-known uh, member of the Indian Medical Association and has published various journals uh, in Indian and uh, international forums. We welcome you, Sir. So uh, we have changed you to the host, sir. You can now share your screen.